Hi there. So today I want to talk about black bodies and black body radiation. First let me start off by defining what a black body is. A black body is an ideal system that absorbs all the radiation that's incident upon it. The opposite of a black body would be a perfect reflector. Now I like to think of a perfect reflector as a spherical mirror because it would reflect light no matter where you hit it. So I like to think of a disco ball. That's just me. A black body is often pictured in many textbooks as a black cube or rectangular solid that has a little pinhole in it. And what happens is the hole is really what you think of as the black body. Radiation gets into the hole and the radiation can bounce around inside the black body before it gets absorbed by the black surface, but it's really hard to escape because it can't get back out of the pinhole. So that's thought of as a perfect black body. Now, it was known in the 1800s that objects emitted radiation solely based upon the surface properties, how reflective it was, and what temperature it was. So if you looked at the radiation coming off of an object, that radiation would be called the black body radiation. Now, I don't know if it's real or not, um, but people often uh, envision uh, black body radiation. It's, it's easy to think of it if you think of infrared cameras. So if you go around and you look at infrared cameras, most things in the room temperature region radiate in the infrared, and that's where we live, right? So you can see people in infrared, um, and they kind of glow. That means you can see in the dark. So sometimes these are night vision goggles. Now, I don't know if it's real or not, but uh, some group of people walked around and took images with an infrared camera of people farting on the sly. So it's pretty funny. I recommend you watch it. It'll really, you know, hone in on the idea of infrared radiation in a very non-boring sort of way. Now, as I said, an object at any temperature is known to emit thermal radiation, and the characteristics depend upon the temperature and the surface properties. Now, the thermal radiation curve is actually a continuous distribution of wavelengths from all portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. However, it has a peak, and the peak of that cur curve corresponds to most of the radiation that's being emitted from the body. Now, where that peak is depends upon how hot the object is. So something like a filament that's been heat heated up quite a bit by passing a high current through it, it might it might glow in the visible range of the spectrum, whereas human beings that radiate more around room temperature or slightly above will emit in the infrared. So at room temperature, the wavelengths of thermal radiation are in the infrared region. As the surface temperature increases, the wavelength changes. It'll glow red, eventually white. The wavelength will get shorter and shorter. If you increase the temperature even more, it'll go into the ultraviolet and then into the x-ray range. The basic problem that scientists in the 1800s had with understanding black body radiation was in describing and fitting the curve that came off of the black body radiator. They couldn't fit it based upon the physics that they understood at the time. So there were a couple of laws that people were able to extract, even without fitting the curves, about black body radiators. So first was Stefan's law, and this said that the total power of the emitted radiation increases with the temperature of the object, T, compared to the background temperature, T0, and with the surface area of the object, A, and its emissivity, E. We'll talk about the emissivity in just a second, but for now, here's Stefan's law. The power P is equal to sigma AE, and then T to the fourth minus the background temperature to the fourth. Here, sigma is a constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth in SI units. A was the surface area of the object, so as the object's surface area got larger, of course, the power went up. And of course, as the temperature got higher compared to the background, the power went up as well. Now, the other thing that was known about um, black body radiators, or able to be predicted about black body radiators, was where the peak of that intensity curve was in the wavelength according to the temperature. So that was Wien's displacement law as shown here. Lambda max times T is equal to 2.898 times 10 to the minus 3 meters times Kelvin. Lambda max is the uh, wavelength that corresponded to the maximum intensity of light emitted. And of course, T is the temperature. So I said I'd get back to E in a second. E is a parameter called the emissivity, and it characterizes how good of a black body something is. In other words, how well it meets that perfect black body approximation. A perfect black body, you'd have an emissivity equal to 1. And then for that spherical mirror or my disco ball that you talked about, 
for a perfect reflector, you would have E is equal to zero. A good approximation of a black body, like we said, would be that pinhole in a black object. And that would be a perfect absorber or a perfect black body, which would be E is equal to one. And then maybe the perfect reflector might be really nice picture from this M.C. Escher hand reflecting sphere. So that might be a perfect reflector for you. Okay. Here's what the black body radiation curves look like for a range of temperatures 2,000 to 4,000 Kelvin. And what you can see is that the intensity does in fact increase with increasing temperature. And this could be um, likened to Stefan's law. P is equal to sigma A E T to the fourth minus T naught to the fourth. As the temperature increases, the intensity goes up. And that's seen here. This orange curve, which is kind of uh, low intensity, is 2,000 Kelvin. The green is higher at 3,000 Kelvin. And then the red is the highest on this plot anyway at 4,000 Kelvin. So the amount of radiation emit emitted increases with increasing temperature, and that would be the area under this curve. The peak wavelength decreases with increasing temperature. Yet again, you can see that the dashed lines here are drawn from the peak of the curve down to the wavelength axis so that we can picture this a little bit better. But you can see that the wavelength does, in fact, to go down as the temperature goes up, and that's according to Bean's law. Now, there was an earlier classical attempt to explain black body radiation. They tried to have a theory that gave them a curve that matched the black body radiator curve, but it didn't do so well. That attempt was the rayleigh genes law. Here, the intensity, I, which is a function of wavelength and temperature, is equal to 2 pi c kbt over lambda to the fourth. Here, yet again, c is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Kb is Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Boltzmann's constant is a constant that gets used a lot in thermodynamics. T is the temperature, and lambda is the wavelength. So at long wavelengths, this actually matched experimental, experimental results pretty well. Okay, Let me show you what that looked like. So if you overlay for the same temperature, say 4,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, modeled by both the rayleigh genes law and then the experimental results, the experimental results are here in red, and the rayleigh genes law is shown in blue. And you can see that at long wavelengths, those curves start to overlap, and it does a pretty good job. But you can see that as the wavelengths get shorter, the rayleigh genes law does an abysmal job at matching the experimental results. It's terrible. There was a major disagreement between the rayleigh genes law and experiment. And this mismatch became known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. This is made a lot worse by the fact that even at the time that they understood that you'd have to have an infinite amount of energy as the wavelength approached zero. And that made no sense, right? Look, the rayleigh genes law blows up at wavelength going to zero, shooting to infinity. So even with what was understood at the time, they knew that that meant they'd have to have an infinite amount of light, which is impossible. So let me describe and explain what the classical thinking here is. And then let's talk about why the classical thinking is wrong. That can best be described um, with a series of cartoons and thought questions that I found in um, this book, Thinking Physics, by Lewis Carroll Epstein. It's actually a really great book, and I highly recommend you buy it. It's an older version now, but it's got a lot of really good conceptual questions in physics that help you really grasp the material. So let me start off with this one called What's in the Oven? Which would be most likely to be contained in the warm oven in your stove? And by contained, what we mean here is Let's form standing waves that are inside, contained entirely inside this stove. All right. Now, this makes sense if you think about it in terms of a classical wave, like a sound wave or a water wave. Okay. In that case, you can form a standing wave if the wave fits inside your container. You can't have a standing water wave, for example, that doesn't fit in your wave tank. It doesn't even make sense. And so the question here is, would a 2 meter radio wave or a 2 millimeter radio wave fit better inside this oven? And of course the answer is that a 2 millimeter wave, a shorter wavelength wave, would be much more likely to fit inside of a container than a longer one. So that's what classical physics knew about waves of the time, right? They had to form standing waves, and these standing waves are much more likely to form if they're shorter wavelength. The next bit is, let's assume that you've got a wave tank. 
and you start off a wave, you're driving it, for example, by moving something up and down to slosh it, or you're in a bathtub and you're a kid and you're scooting back and forth inside your bathtub and it sets up a standing wave in the bathtub. And then you stop. You don't force it or drive it anymore and you just watch what happens to that water as time goes on. Well, what would be more likely to happen? Would your long wavelength wave become a bigger, longer wave or would it become a whole bunch of really short little ripples? Well, if you've ever played in a bathtub, and if you haven't, I highly recommend that you go home immediately and do this, then you'll see that your long wavelength wave eventually sort of becomes all these little ripples in your wave tank, okay? So that's what happens. A longer wavelength wave over time will become a whole bunch of really short waves. Now let's think about these ideas that we've taken from water waves and apply it to light. If light waves behave like water waves and you put some yellow light in a tank, after a while you would find that the yellow light would turn blue, okay? Now we know now that that's crazy, that you can't put yellow light inside of something and then have it turn blue because the blue light is more energetic than the yellow light. We know this now. But remember, if you put yourself in the perspective of scientists from the late 1800s, early 1900s, they didn't understand about the relationship between the frequency of light and its energy. That came later, all right? So we know now, of course, that light waves don't behave like water waves in the tank, that they're totally separate ideas. But you have to put yourself in the perspective of the scientists that were working at the time. So here's where Max Planck comes in. He was a German physicist. And in 1918, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the quantized nature of energy, in part because of, well, entirely because of all the work that he did on black body radiators and coming up with a theoretical model that described the black body radiation curve. Okay? And even though he doesn't look incredibly happy about it in this picture, I'm sure that he really was. All right, so here's Planck's model, his theory of black body radiation. Now, he developed this model in 1900, um, the theory that led to an equation for the intensity of the radiation that matched the experimental results from a black body radiator. So this equation is in complete agreement with experimental observations, even still to this day. What he did was he assumed that the radiation emitted from a black body radiator came from atomic oscillations inside the radiator itself. He envisioned the black body radiator as a solid with atoms, shown here, that are connected by these little springs. And the atoms would oscillate, okay? The atoms would oscillate due to their temperature. That was an idea that was known. There was a linkage between motion and temperature, right? And so he would assume that these solids would sit there and vibrate in their lattice position. Now he made two assumptions about the nature of the oscillators in these cavity walls. Assumption number one was this, that the energy of the oscillator can only have certain discrete values, E sub n. These values would be described by the equation NHF. H was a constant that he extracted from his fit. It became known as Planck's constant later. F is the frequency of the oscillation. And N is an integer, a positive integer, that's called the quantum number, sometimes also called the energy level. So what this equation says is that the energy of these oscillations is quantized. It comes in discrete units. And each discrete energy value corresponds to a different quantum state. Now, these oscillators, and this was his second assumption, emit or absorb energy when making a transition from one quantum state to another. Because energy is conserved, you can't jump from one energy state to another without getting that energy from somewhere if you're going up or emitting that energy if you're going down in energy, okay? So the energy difference here that corresponds to the difference between the initial and the final energy states is either emitted or absorbed, depending on whether you're going up or going down, by a single quantum of radiation. An oscillator emits or absorbs energy only when it changes its energy level to satisfy energy conservation requirements. And the energy that's carried by each quantum of radiation, as he called it, is equal to HF. So this gave rise to an energy level diagram like the one shown here. Here, energy is shown on the vertical axis. Each of these black horizontal lines on the energy diagram represent allowed energy levels according to Planck's theory. 
Here we start off with n equal to 0, so that's down here at the bottom. And then we have n equal to 1, so you have e is equal to hf. n equal to 2 is 2hf, and so on and so forth. The double-headed arrows indicate allowed transitions, and so you can hop an energy level to neighboring states up or down. And then any time that you did this, you would have to emit or absorb radiation in that amount of the quantum of radiation. Now, this was Planck's model, and he turned out to be totally and completely right, okay? He didn't understand quantum mechanics. It hadn't even been invented yet. Quantum mechanics wasn't invented until the 1920s and 1930s. He did this in 1900, before quantum mechanics came about, before the idea of a discretization of energy was sort of embraced by the physics community. We now know, though, that even without quantum mechanics, that atoms in their lattice positions can be modeled as quantum harmonic oscillators. Now, quantum mechanics and the Schrodinger equation will actually predict energy levels of n plus 1 half times hf, where n is an integer. And the transitions between the energy levels have energy e is equal to hf. So he was only off by a factor of plus one half. Other than that, he was totally right, which is pretty amazing for not having quantum mechanics. Now, the average energy of a wave is the average energy difference between the levels of the oscillator, but you also have to weight it according to the probability that that wave is going to be emitted. And it's this weighting factor that helps to give the characteristic peak that you see in the intensity of black body radiators. This weighting is described by the Boltzmann distribution law. Now you might know Boltzmann from the Maxwell-Boltzmann model of an ideal gas. All right, so pretty big in thermodynamics. Now we're not going to talk too much about Boltzmann's factors here except to briefly introduce them. And I'm going to refer you to your thermodynamics class for further study of this important idea and concept. But basically, the probability of a state being occupied can be described by the Boltzmann factor, which is E, 2.781828, to the minus E over KT, where large E is the energy of the state, okay, here, NHF, and KB times T is Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin, times the temperature T. So what you can see, if you look at this, is that let's say that the energy of the state, HF, is proportional to the temperature um, times Boltzmann's constant, so that E over KT is approximately 1. Then you have E to the minus 1. But now let's say that you've got a much higher energy, right, where E is, say, 1,000 times KT. Then you would have E to the minus 1,000. And of course, that's a much smaller number than E to the minus 1. So that makes energies at close to KT much more likely than much higher energies. Also, it makes them, um, weights them according to if the energy is lower as well, okay? But lower energy differences like E to the minus 1 are much li more likely than higher energy ones, and this is the weighting factor that we talked about. So if you take into account the weighting and also take into account Planck's model for the discretized energy level jumps, then you end up with this curve, Planck's model. At short wavelengths, there's a large energy separation, a low probability of excited states, and few downward transitions. And at long wavelengths, there's a small energy separation, a high probability of excited states, and many downward transitions, okay? The full description of the intensity of a black body radiator according to the wavelength is described this way. I is the intensity, it's a function of lambda, the wavelength and temperature, and it's equal to 2 pi hc squared over lambda the fifth e to the hc over lambda kt minus 1. Here h is Planck's constant. Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. He extracted this as a fit from the curve. We now know that it's a fundamental constant of nature and it appears a lot in quantum mechanics. Now at long wavelengths, Planck's equation reduces to the Rayleigh genes expression, and so it fits classical physics at long wavelengths. And at short wavelengths, it actually predicts the exponential decrease in the intensity with the decreasing wavelength, and this is in agreement with the experimental results. And so the model was a resounding success, and it was one of the first times that the discretization of energy levels was discussed in physics. And it helped give rise to quantum mechanics that came later.
Now, interestingly enough, at the time, Planck did not recognize that his equation, E is equal to HF, could be applicable for all light. He didn't make that leap and say light has energy, E is equal to HF. He just thought that it was a good for energy level transitions in black body radiators. It took Einstein, as we already discussed in the photoelectric effect, to realize that E is equal to HF gives the energy for a photon of light. Now, why was this such a big leap? To remind you, if light is a wave, then the energy for a classical wave is described as 1 half Ka squared, where A is your amplitude, okay? We know this is true for water waves. Large amplitude water waves are much scarier than short amplitude water waves, and large amplitude sound is much louder, okay? So for classical waves, this works. But for light, the energy is proportional to the frequency, not the amplitude. And so the energy does not depend upon the frequency. And this was a leap that it took Einstein to make. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you in class.